And before we get started, I want to give a special shout out to next month's chefs who will be featuring delectable and classic dishes kosher for Passover. Mark Weiner, who was going to be here today but isn't here, um, is one of our chefs who will be exploring Passover popper, popovers served with a delightful strawberry butter. And Elisa Bladder, who is here. Elisa, we wave. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Um, she will be sharing all of the how to's with matzo brai. So please note your calendars for Sunday, March 21st at 10, because you won't want to miss it. And it'll just help us all get ready for Passover. Um, and as we immerse into today's class titled Bulabusta Boards, I feel the need to define the Yiddish word for Bulabusta so that we can all celebrate a Jewish mindset for the endless possibilities that can be had with boards, otherwise known as charcuterie or grazing boards. So a bolabusta is a Yiddish term for a gifted Jewish homemaker, one who is efficient and competent. But um, um, allow me to introduce to you today's featured chef, Suzanne Epstein Lang, who truly embodies the term of endearment to the ninth degree. She is wildly creative, extraordinarily organized, highly talented, and completely adorable. Get ready to be completely inspired and learn from the hostess with the mostest. Oh, that was sweet. Actually, Pam Lester's the hostess with the mostest, so that was really kind. Um, before we begin, and we're gonna dive right into it, but I just wanted to kind of give you kind of the preset for today's class. I always try to work in a nonlinear fashion so that everything comes together at one time. Now, these particular dishes are gonna be fine, cold, or at room temperature, but this is just sort of my method. And I'm gonna pan around and show you the kitchen for just a moment because it looks like this mess every Sunday morning when we start doing our batch cooking. And then somehow in the end, it all comes together and it's all clean, even though we're doing multitasking and working on multiple recipes at once. So um, unlike a real, a real cooking show where it all looks perfect, I'm gonna show you the mess that, um, that can happen. So first, um, I have my oven, which is gonna be in use. Of course, we have back here the prep station where we're gonna put everything together at the end. I have a massive pile of vegetables here along with my bar mops and where I'm gonna be cutting everything. A little tip I wanted to show you guys is that my sink is filled with, my clean side of my sink is filled with water, a little vinegar and kosher salt, which I've swished around because we're gonna throw all those vegetables in there at the same time and be able to clean them up at once and just sort of multitask that way. Then I've got a colander sitting here along with everything that's gonna go in the food processor later. And because we're on a Zoom cooking class, I have my computer pulled up so I can see all of your faces. So if at any point during this, I'm out of view, you know, someone let me know. Um, I'm gonna try to zoom in on my hands most of the time. And I promise you guys and my family, so if you're in the middle of chaos like this as well, that at the end of the day, it all comes together that's gonna be beautifully put together into one of these boards, which are all the rage right now, and everything's gonna be cleaned up. So um, it's controlled chaos, and we're working multitasking on a lot of different things at once. But if you get lost, don't worry, there's a lot of inactive time. We're gonna be doing a lot of talking while we, while we work, because there is a lot of inactive time for these um, recipes. And we're gonna work with um, some recipes today that are from some of my favorite Jewish cookbook authors, Molly Katzen and Molly Ye. And if you're not familiar with those ladies by name, you may be can, familiar with Molly Katzen's um, seminal um, vegetarian cookbook, which inspired America to embrace vegetarianism, the Moosewood Cookbook. Um, she is Jewish. She is a classically trained musician and artist who happened to have changed the way America eats. Um, and then we're gonna use Molly Ye, who you may know as Girl Meets Farm on the Food Network. She's also a Jewish chef who um, has, is inspired by her Chinese American and Jewish heritages and blends those really nicely. And they just happen to be great recipes for today. So I'm really excited about that. And then we're gonna talk about the boards and um, how to make them Jewish and also how to make them. So without further ado, 
we're going to get to the first part, which is if you um, could go to your ovens and preheat them to 400 degrees. So I'm just going to pop out of screen for one moment. All right, step one is complete. That was pretty easy. So by show of hands, I am wondering if people are using the canned chickpeas or if people soaked. Oh, raise your hand if you soaked. Am I the only soaker? There's my daughter. Isn't she cute? Okay, can you guys hear me? Am I, am I, okay, people are with cans, okay. Then I'm gonna grab my soaked beans and you should grab your canned beans and start opening them up. All right, so what I did and canned beans, so I love hummus, I love hummus either way. Um, anyway, I'll eat it on a plane in the rain, um, but I kind of have, a, there's a hierarchy and you know, on the bottom is, is the stuff you can buy, uh, which is, which is great. Um, and then there is the stuff that you make with the can. And then if you're feeling extra, extra like guacamole, you know, it's really extra, you can do the chickpeas in, um, the pot and soak overnight. I have a funny story. So I'm going to start draining them so you can get your chickpeas in your calendar. Um, I had an Israeli roommate in college, um, who first taught me how to make, hummus from scratch and we joked that the first step was always taking your roommate's pan and burning the chickpeas on the bottom. So without fail today, I burned my chickpeas a little bit. Um, you can see there's a little brown here, but that's okay. They're still gonna taste delicious. Um, and so I do consider this like the top of the hierarchy when you have the chickpeas that you have made and soaked um, at home. Um, if you wanna be even extra on top of that, you pull off the holes. Um, they, they come off really easily and I kind of go in the middle. Um, and what I do is I de-hull, um, what I can. Um, do you guys know what I'm talking about? Do you need an example? Okay. So I'm going to zoom in here on my chickpeas. So normally they will not be brown at all. This is due to the fact that I burnt them, um, a little bit at the bottom of the pan. But when you soak and simmer your chickpeas, um, you, and you go to drain them, you're going to get a hull that peels off the chickpea. It's completely edible. There's no reason not to use it. And some people think that it's delicious, particularly if you're roasting your chickpeas um, because it just becomes an extra little piece of crispy goodness. Um, but what I do is I just sort of, um, it makes a creamier hummus if you pull the hulls off. And so rather than you know, making it perfect. What I do is I just kind of go through and I pick out what I can. And I pre-did that a little bit when I was dealing with the, the part where they burnt. And so I've already had an opportunity to pre-haul a little bit. Um, so you don't have to sit here and watch me do that today, especially since most of you are using the can. But anyway, I'm just going to leave those right there and um, in my calendar and set aside for a moment. Um, and we're gonna leave the hummus here at this point for just a minute because we're gonna multitask and switch to other things. So if you will switch tasks with me and fill your pot that came from your chickpeas, and I'm just gonna give mine a little rinse. It does not matter, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just had clean chickpeas in it. So I'm just gonna rinse that a little further. And then I'm gonna set that aside and we're going to put, oh, sorry, a, a small amount of water in it, maybe um, a couple of cups. It doesn't really matter. You just, we're gonna steam and uh, boil our beets. And so that's just a way to, you know, we're gonna set that aside. That's gonna be the pot for that. You'll have a clean pot. It doesn't matter that my pot has a little bit of chicken. And you'll wanna grab your beets. So this is straight from the grocery yesterday. Um, I got a couple of kinds of beets. I got a golden and red just because I like the variety. It does not matter either way, whatever you got. Um, and we're gonna start scrubbing them together, getting them cleaned up. Um, we're not gonna peel them because that can make your hands a giant mess, um, but we're gonna go on and just um, scrub them up. So, I have a vegetable brush. 
um, that I use exclusively for vegetables. Um, it's, you know, they're, they're dirty. So um, you're wanting to, it's gonna get a, want to give it a really good scrub because to knock off the dirt. And this vinegar and kosher salt solution tends to help peel, you know, bring out the dirt, bring out any little bugs that happen to live in beets um, um, or in, in the greens in particular. And then I'm gonna just go on and cut to about an inch of the stem. And actually, these are totally edible. Um, has anyone, by show of hands, eaten beet greens before? Okay, I'm seeing some. They're really, they're really quite delicious. You have to clean them really well, like a spinach or a kale. And so they can go right here. In, in a, and these are organic, so um, especially they might be a little dirtier. They might be cleaner of pesticides and other yucky stuff we wouldn't want, but they might be a little dirtier. So, you know, soak them and save them for later if you want or discard them. We're not using them in this particular meal. But, um, and I just wanna show you how beautiful this looks. Um, it's like a beautiful mess, you know, they're soaking there. And to me, that's like a still life, gorgeous. And, you know, you just have to embrace that like your kitchen's gonna be a little bit of a mess with your beet water here. Okay, so. Next step, we're just gonna throw these in, in our pack. So, um, and then we're gonna put them away for a long time. My preferred method of cooking beets is usually to roast, but they take a really long time. And the original Molly Katzen recipe in the Moosewood cookbook actually said to boil these. So that's what we're gonna do. Um, if you feel like you don't have enough water, as I feel like I did not, um, Feel free to go in and add some water. And then we're gonna put those on a stove. Um, I will take you with me. I'm gonna put it on high um, because we really wanna get that boiling because like I said, these beets do take a while. So um, that's that's it for now. We're gonna, I'm gonna put my lid on there so that, um, so that it, you know, increases the heat quickly. And then, I'm gonna come over here back to, and this is gonna give you some time to catch up. I don't wanna to go too quickly by any, by any means. So if you're still back doing your, draining your cans of chickpeas, that's fine. If you are using the can, I would recommend that you rinse them so that that gets some of the additional salt off um, because then we'll be able to add the salt that we wish in the recipe rather than having so much sodium from the can um, mixed in with it. Um, Okay, so as, as people are catching up there and getting a moment to get their beets scrubbed and in the, um, in the pot, does anyone have any questions? Okay, I, I guess we're a group without questions. That's great. Um, is my pacing going okay? Okay, all right. So the next thing I'm gonna do is right into my trusty sink here. I'm gonna go on and throw um, throw all of my peppers in. Um, now it called for three peppers. The peppers I was able to get this week were a little bit smaller, so I'm going to do a fourth. Does not matter. Um, you, you might have seen me put five in right now. That's because I'm also multitasking, and we're going to put some peppers in um, to slice up later on the board. And at the same time, I'm going to go on and start. You don't have to do this, obviously. Um, but I'm gonna start pulling together my other veggies. Um, just giving you a minute to catch up. I happen to have seen these beautiful little eggplants what, while I was, um, can, am I centered okay? <laughs> um, I, I think that I, I launched the poll and I think when I did that, people don't see you anymore. Is that right? Okay, so I was more careful. <laughs> when I launch it. I thought that she could still, we could still see her when I did that. So I apologize. Um, oh, it's no big deal. I'm just talking about washing vegetables, which everybody knows how to do. They can't see you for just a minute and then, okay. and then they'll be able to see you again. <laughs> so I will, I will be more careful when I do it. It's no worries. I was just like, I think I'm gone. <laughs> I still can't see Suzanne. I know. I'm going to get okay. fired. 
wait, okay. I'm gonna end the poll here. So last second, if you wanna vote on hummus. All right, here's our, here's our, our answers for our hummus poll. So Suzanne, just so you know, can you see the, can you see the results of the hummus poll? Um, I'm trying to on my other screen, but I'm also, um, I can't see. Okay. You guys I'm can gonna see let you get back, but I will just let you know that 43% of the people on this call <laughs> like to eat their hummus on carrot and celery sticks. Well, perfect, because yeah. that feeds in perfectly to what I was <laughs> about to say, which is I'm starting to clean my carrots and celery. Okay. So are, can you guys see me now again? Now they should be able to hopefully soon. No, yes. No. Shoot. Did we lose her from that? Well, I'm, can you hear me? Yes. But there we go. She's back. I see myself. Yes. Do you see? All right. Okay. We'll coordinate that next time. Sorry. Okay. So at this point, all I've done is I have got everything soaking to clean. And you certainly don't have to be doing this at home, but we do have carrots and celery um, for this delicious hummus that we're going to be making. And um, I, I was saying that I happen to have, when I was, you know, I just had mentioned everyone should get whatever they like, whatever vegetables they like. And when I was at the store, I saw these gorgeous little eggplants and I couldn't resist um, the idea that those would be a part of the vegetables that I would like today uh, with this Middle Eastern um, inspired, um, Israeli inspired beef. So um, I've thrown those in my pot as well. Okay, so at this point, is everyone ready to move on from chickpeas to cleaning up peppers together? Okay. Um, Suzanne, one quick question from the crowd. Um, yeah. Is there a certain kind of vinegar we should use in the sink or not use? You can just use plain old white vinegar. Um, I think I put like around a fourth a cup for the sink along with two tablespoons of kosher salt and swish it around and it just makes a good vegetable wash. I don't always do it this way. Of course, I run it under the sink in my colander, but on Sundays when I'm doing batch cooking, I find this just to be a great place because I have my cutting boards here. I have my trash can right below where I can put my recycling and my scraps. Um, so that's, that's why I started doing it this way. Um, but it's certainly wash them however you like. You know what I mean? There's no magic here. And okay, so um, I'm gonna pull out my red pepper. Um, this is for the first step of the, um, I always feel like I'm gonna mispronounce this, the muhamara. I practiced that for you guys, muhamara. Um, muhamara is a Syrian dish, which has made its way to Israel. Um, a lot of these things that are Israeli cuisine are really um, from other countries, of course, because we had an immigration of Jewish people from other places in the Middle East coming when Israel was uh, became a state. We have people who've moved from all over the world to make Aliyah and be in Israel. So the question is, is it Jewish? Is it Israeli? Is it Arab? Um, and it, it's all of it. But this came to Israel from Jewish people who were living in Syria um, and then it became a part of Israeli cuisine and made it into Mali Ye's cookbook, which is where I read about it and it's delicious. So um, you could, there are a lot of ways to skin a cat and there are a lot of ways to skin a pepper. You could do this completely um, a different way, but for to the sake of today, I'm going to roughly chop this pepper um, and pull out the seeds just um, to expedite our process a little bit. I'm gonna leave it in big chunks because we do wanna pull that skin off whole. Um, but this will save us the step of de-seeding later and the ribs will mostly be gone um, if we do it this way. So I'm just kind of getting big chunks. Um, you could do this completely whole. You know, there are people that um, peel, roast and peel their peppers over an open, open flame of their um, gas stove. There are people that do it on the, um, you know, cook them in the oven at a high temperature, which is what we're gonna do. Some people blister them. 
in the um, under the broiler. You know, there are just a lot of ways to accomplish this. Um, but for for me, the ease of this for today for what we're showing makes the most sense. So I'm just going to take these peppers while you have a minute to clean your peppers and ketchup. I'm going to grab a cookie sheet. I called it a cookie sheet, but you might really want to use a jelly roll pan. Um, that's We kind of use those terms together in our house. Um, and some people do this in foil. I don't think it's necessary. I'm a fan of using as little natural, you know, resources as possible. You can see I do have paper towels here, but if it's a depletable resource or, you know, it's something we try to use in moderation at our house. So I'm just gonna put a big glove of olive oil on here. Um, if you don't, if you're afraid of fat, certainly you can use a, um, you can use just a spray anything really. And I'm gonna go throw these in that super hot oven. And I'm gonna have you come with me. And we're just gonna put this in the oven that we preheated earlier. And I'm actually gonna- need to clean up, you can also line that pan with parchment paper. Yes, yes. So um, we're back over here at our vegetable prep station and we have Suzanne. Um, quick question: Is there yeah. a certain kind of olive oil that you are drawn to? Interesting. There, there are real, there are real answers to that. You know, things that have higher heat and things that are better to eat at lower temperatures. I am not that sophisticated. Um, I know that there are things that cook better at higher temperatures and that you, you're not supposed to need the extra virgin. That's more for tasting. I just buy the EVOO and use it for everything. But I'm sure that that's not the correct answer. If you had a real chef, you, they would not tell you that. But that's, that's the chef-ish part of this today. <laughs> Feel free to put in the chat box if you have a special kind you like. Uh, share that with us. Okay, so at this point, we should have our um, beets beginning to boil. Um, I'm just going to check my pot and see if they're simmering, if I need to do anything, but that's going to be, we should be able to leave them for really, really quite some time at this point. Okay, I'm just getting a simmer on that. And I am, uh, peppers are in the oven. So now we are gonna be able to return to our hummus. Is everyone ready to get back to the hummus? What temperature are your peppers at? I've got them at 400. Um, you can do them higher. That, that's just what we set it to at the beginning um, of, the, of the class. But you can certainly, you could go full broil here. You could go 450. Um, I just think, I just picked 400. There's really no, like I said, there are a lot of ways to skin a pepper. So um, I think 400 is where I'm going to go. But if anyone wants to go higher, you know, or if you have another method, does anyone have another method that they want to share? Okay. Um, so when we're coming back to these chickpeas, um, I'm going to... Um, obviously be pulling mine out of my calendar um, and I'm guessing yours are going to be in your, in your calendar at this point also. I'm going to take um, a small pan and just knock a few, very few, onto my pan. Um, you know, not a lot. These are going to become the topping for our hummus. You're going to hear me talk a lot today about what can you do to to put one more thing. What's one more little trick and tip? And this is mine. Um, I always like to garnish with things that are in the dish so people kind of see what they're eating and know what they're eating. And um, so I wanted to leave a few chickpeas whole. And because I am extra, I'm gonna spray them with a little bit of my just, um, I use a non-expeller spray. If you have Pam, that's fine. I use this one because it doesn't have like an aerosol. Um, and I'm gonna throw these in that 400 degree oven with my um, peppers because they're going to just crisp up and roast up. I'll be right back. 
And I just checked, my beets are a boiling. Um, so um, it, I'm gonna give you a second if you wanna do that with your chickpeas as well and throw a few over to the side. And meanwhile, I'm going to take the rest of them and get the rest of my chickpeas in the food processor. You can do this with a small food processor in batches. You can do this in a blender. Um, I just happen to have a big food processor, so that's what I'm using. But none of this that we're doing today should require um, any special, you know, equipment. This is this is all about ease. This is a very rustic style of eating, uh, so it's it should work. Okay, so from here forward, we are going to actually focus, sorry, I have my grocery bag still sitting here. We're gonna focus on the hummus and we're gonna go through the recipe as it is listed um, from this point in the um, Balabasta Board's guide, but also this is directly, I have my printout directly from Molly Yeh. Um, and so we're gonna just start here. So we, and, and also this is like really a cook with your heart kind of dish. Um, everybody's going to be able to adjust and work with what they have and um, and kind of taste with their heart um, and measure that way as well. But just for ease, I will follow her specific instructions. Um, so the first thing she calls for are the chickpeas, and you're going to use two cans. I'm going to use mine that I've soaked and salted overnight, and a half a cup of tahini. Um, does everyone have tahini? Hopefully, okay. Um, so if you're not familiar with this ingredient, it is, this is hard to open sometimes. If you're not familiar with this ingredient, it is just ground sesame seeds. That's, that's it. Um, it used to be something that you had to go get from a specialty store. This one I did get at um, an international market. However, you can get it at Trader Joe's. You can get it in the regular old grocery store these days. Um, it's really something that used to be hard to find. And um, back when I lived with my Israeli roommate, it was really something that was difficult to find. And now these days, it's just so easy. You can get it in any grocery store. Um, if you've never worked with it, it's sort of like natural peanut butter or any other natural um, you know, nut or seed butter where it does require some stirring because the oil will separate to the top. Um, so I find, oh, this is really needing stirring. Sometimes I find a wooden spoon, like the backside of a wooden spoon is the best to really dig down into a nut butter or a seed if you're not used to doing it that way. Uh, I mean, you know, if you're not used to having separated um, seed or nut butter, okay. So we're gonna end up with a half a cup going into our pot. Um, and let's see, I have a fourth a cup measure here. And again, this is not, this doesn't have to be so precise, um, but I know that, you know, if you come to a cooking class, you wanna see the precise measurements and see what the person's doing. Um, if, if we weren't on this, I would probably just, uh, glug what I thought was a half a cup in. Again, you know, this is a natural good fat. Um, so I can understand, you know, people might want to use with caution, but it, it really is what's going to make it so creamy and delicious. Oh, I hear my beets beginning to simmer back behind me. Okay. So um, we'll just throw that right in um, our food processor. It also calls for two cloves of garlic. And I am never a person to let anyone tell me how much garlic to use. Um, I feel like you, you get to pick that yourself and I um, am probably gonna use a little bit more than what it calls for. And I'm gonna use a chopped because that is something that um, it takes a while to peel and use the press. So I'm gonna cheat a little bit and I'm gonna do um, a teaspoon for each, um, for each clove, and then I'm gonna put a little extra because we love garlic at our house. Um, so that's my two cloves. We need 
a fourth a cup of water. And this is one of those things that you'll be able to adjust later. Um, if you feel like your home is a little runny, I'm gonna put just a smidge because I still had some tahini stuck at the bottom of my, um, my bowl there. And then we need lemon. And we're gonna need a lot of lemon throughout today. today. Um, it only calls for a tablespoon at this juncture, but I feel like that's the same as the garlic. That's just something that we, we always like a little extra of at our house. Um, there are multiple ways to squeeze a lemon. Um, you know, you don't need a fancy tool. I happen to like this one very much. Um, you can also turn it upside, you can use your hand, of course, and you can squeeze into your hand so that you catch the seeds. Um, or you can use a fork and really get in there. Um, but I, I really like this tool. Oh, hard lemon. I really like this tool. Um, because as you can see, it really gets the most out of it. And then it leaves your seeds and things underneath. Um, but certainly you can squeeze another way. And I'm having a, this is, this didn't yield as much as I would usually like. Um, usually you get about a tablespoon much more easily. This was not a particularly juicy lemon. Um, I'll give you a tip in just a moment about how to get more juice out of your lemon. Um, but let me go in and squeeze this in. And hopefully that will be enough. Um, as you guys are working with your lemons, I will show you what I can do. If a lemon really doesn't have enough juice at all, you can put it in the microwave for about 20 seconds to warm it up and hopefully yield more. Um, yield more juice, but you can also just take it and roll it on your counter, um, which tends to kind of uh, expel some of the juice and prepare it to be squeezed better. Now in this, we're gonna need a lot more lemon later. So um, do whatever you need to do to get your lemon and then that's it. We're gonna put the top on and it's gonna get loud for a moment. Oh, wait. Little malfunction. It's going to get loud for a moment, but I'm going to begin the process. So um, let me get started. Maybe a good time for a poll while I just pulse. And we're doing the, um, what kind of Jewish host are you poll? Me or someone else? Well, no, that's what we're polling everybody on. Oh, excellent. <laughs> but we'll let, I know you're all pulsing too, so we'll give you a little time. While we're while Suzanne's doing while we're doing the poll, you can't see Suzanne, um, but she's just pulsing away her food processor. Suzanne, can they do this in a blender? You absolutely can. You absolutely can do this in a blender. Um, honestly, you know this, and I, I'm going to talk about hummus for a moment while everyone's catching up and. Not only can you do it with a blender, you can do it with a fork. Um, the idea of hummus, I talked about, is it Jewish, is it Arab, is it, what is it? Well, it's ancient. Um, literally in the book of Ruth, we, we hear about hummus. Uh, I think it's either Ruth or Naomi serves Boaz hummus in their tent. So this is you know, an ancient thing and certainly 
you know, we didn't have a food processor in my house until at least the early 80s. I, I think when I was a small child, I remember my parents getting it and it was a big deal. So you can use a blender, you can use an emulsion blender, the stick. Um, I've done it that way. If you don't have an emulsion blender for 20 bucks, it's one of the best kitchen tools there is. If you have a little smoothie ninja, it works beautifully. Um, but remember, thousands of years ago, people did not have any of this. And you can always use, you know, good old uh, elbow grease and a fork even if you need to. So nothing fancy is ever needed for any of this. Um, so, so Suzanne, hold on a second. I'm going to end the poll. So if you need to vote still or you want to, you got, I'll give you 10 more seconds and then I'm going to end it. And I, I don't want to you to, I don't want us to miss anything you say. So hold your thoughts. All right, so we're gonna end the poll. And so you know who you're working with. There's a lot of Martha Stewartskis in this crowd, just like Suzanne. The pressure's on. <laughs> oh, I have to share the results, sorry. Here we go. You all can see who, who we are, who we are here. Wait, I want to know whose Makatoon won't let them. <laughs> <laughs> it's anonymous. Don't worry. The poll is anonymous. Um, it might be mine. <laughs> number of potluckers. There's a somebody who likes to order DoorDash. That's probably me. <laughs> and actually, I forgot to vote. Um, and quite a few that love to potchki in the kitchen, just like you, Suzanne. So, all right, I'm gonna stop sharing and back to Suzanne. Okay, in the, are we back? Uh, I don't, we don't see you. Okay, once, I think what happens is when we go to the poll, I have to like come over here and touch my screen again. Okay, cause yeah, we did get to, we could see you while the poll was going on that time. Oh, I have to close that I am seeing the results there. Okay, I just want to show you a close up. I am not satisfied um, with the consistency of my personal hummus yet. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little bit more water. You can always do that. Um, I'm just going to start with another fourth a cup here because that's what I started with originally. And I'm going to re-blend. Um, and I'm going to give that a second because, you know, you really need it to get to the consistency that, that you prefer. And we like a really smooth, velvety hummus at our house. Oh, that's much, much, much better. Are you using like warm water? Um, you know what, just tap, you know, room temperature tap water that I started with. And it's getting there, it's getting there. But before I do anything else, I'm gonna get a clean tasting spoon. Um, I tell you what, I'll just use this this little measuring spoon and then I'll get a clean set. I have a lot of measuring spoons in my house. And I'm gonna taste it because that's the most important thing with any of this, you know, it's to your taste. To me, it needs much more garlic than I put in. And so I'm gonna put in more garlic and more lemon at this point. Um, so feel free to go on and taste yours and see how you feel at this point while I get a clean measuring spoon. I'm maybe going to even put in all the garlic again that I put in the first time. It really needed something for me. And I'm going to take that handy dandy lemon that I had gotten a little more juice from. I believe this is not the fault of the recipe at all. I believe this is because my lemon was um, kind of a dud. So I'm gonna do a little more lemon here. And you'll notice that the recipe did not actually call for salt. Um, now I think salt is important in everything, but especially if you're using the canned chickpeas, um, oh, I'm sorry, it does say salt and pepper to taste. I apologize. And that might have also been, I missed that stuff. That might have also been why mine tasted a little bland. So I'm gonna do about a teaspoon, I'm not measuring, of kosher salt. Um, you can use regular salt. 
Um, I'm actually using a cheapy brand of kosher salt because it's what I'm used to. It's what I grew up with. I just use the Morton's kosher salt. Um, you know, at this point, most of my friends, I think, have a fancy salt cellar sitting on their counter, but I admit I just use the Morton's kosher salt from, from the grocery store aisle. Um, of course, I have some other sea salts and things too, but when I'm using kosher salt, I just use the basics. So I'm going to pulse again, and hopefully you guys will all be doing that as well. If, I feel like I'm, I'm seeing a lot of you are not cooking, um, so hopefully this is not too boring to watch this step as I'm just pulsing my, my, my hummus here. And I, I was doing pulses at this point, I can just get a continuous, um, continuous on button because it's loose enough at this point. We really love all your tips, Suzanne. Thank you. I, I'm going to get another clean tasting spoon. Sorry, I should have had a stack of them sitting here. This won't happen again. Now I've got a lot of clean spoon. Mm, so much better. Um, the baking soda is, I'm answering Beb's question because I was actually able to see it. It, the baking soda was in the instruction if you used the dried chickpeas. It's part of the soaking process. Um, Bev, this is so good. I'm going to take this down to your kids and maybe they'll join CRC. <laughs> Bev's, Bev's son lives on my street and I'm always like building my stuff and I'm like, hey, do you guys want to come to CRC? I think they really don't appreciate it, but maybe Thank they you. Thank you, Suzanne. I appreciate it. <laughs> they, um, it's like, the, can I just say this? They're the loveliest Jewish family, both of them. Both of their parents go to CRC. So um, anyway, um, <laughs> maybe my hummus will be the thing that puts them over the edge. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. <Okay. laughs> so I'm going to turn around here and show you, I don't know if you can see this. I don't know if I'm in focus at all. Um, but I've got my board that I'm going to use here today, which is like a mega board. Um, but I'm going to grab my first bowl. I kind of was going blue um, only because I was doing a Jewish, Israeli kind of inspired day. Um, so I'm going to grab my first big bowl and I'm going to bring it back over. Um, and we're just going to put our hummus in this. Now, while I do this, I'm happy to um, talk about different types of bowls you can use. Um, different types of containers that work for this. And honestly, it could be anything. It could be anything from a, um, it could be anything from a tuna tin. You know, if you're making an individualized board for one, um, you could just be putting this in a small tin or a jelly jar. And so you can see this recipe makes quite a lot. Even in my big bowl, it takes up quite a lot of, of room here. This is a this is a big bowl of hummus to start with. Um, I'm gonna put the rest in a Tupperware, but you could certainly put this in a small mason jar. You could put this in, like I said, literally anything. And the other thing is you could put it right on your board. Um, I saw um, some salad team. I hope I'm just saying that correctly. Maybe someone with Hebrew will tell me I'm saying it wrong. Um, but where the, if they're just putting it directly on the plate, you know, you're getting like your three dips right on the plate. Um, along with things. But um, I like the idea of corralling it on this. And like anything, I'm going to try to make it look beautiful. So I'm going to leave some kind of rough, I'm going to smooth it down, but leave some like rough tips here. And I'm going to make a well in my, um, in my hummus here. And I'm going to take my EVOO. You don't have to add extra oil if you don't want it. But I'm kind of going to make a well in it. And I don't think my chickpeas are probably hard yet. The ones that I put in the oven, they're just probably not roasted yet. Um, but you can put this aside. At this point, you could put a little parsley on top. You could do some chopped onions. Um, I have, um, I'll show you. This spice mix that I like to roast carrots in and do things. Um, this is um, you can see the writing, I think, is in Arabic here, um, but it is one of those things that is like 
the, li the lines are really blurred. This is very popular in Israel. Um, and so I'm just gonna sprinkle some of that on top on my oil. It um, makes it more beautiful. And then when the chickpeas come at the end, they're gonna be just like nestled there and they're gonna be this crunchy, yummy piece that goes along with it. So um, I'm putting this aside for now and um, I'll give you a minute to catch up and you can put yours aside as well. Can I, should I do a poll, Suzanne? Um, yes, that would be great. That'll give everyone a chance to either and put their leftovers in a Tupperware or whatever. So let's take a few minutes and do that because we're going to use our processor or blender or whatever again. I guess answers two and three are kind of the same. <laughs> we don't take ourselves too seriously. <laughs> So Suzanne's special name for these are balabusta boards. You may never have heard that term before, but some people call them charcuterie boards, right, Suzanne? Yes, people call them charcuterie boards. Okay, so I'm a food nerd. I love learning about where food comes from. I once read a book by Mark Kurlansky that was like 2,000 pages about salt. I loved it so much that I followed up and read a book that was 2,000 pages about cod. Um, so you don't have to read the book. I will just, I'm sure there is a book about these boards out there. I think that charcuterie actually implies meat is on the board. Um, however, um, I, and I think it might even need to be from a certain region that the meat needs to be. Um, but I think everyone's calling them charcuterie boards right now. I think that's just kind of the, the term for smorgasbord or raising boards at this time. Of course, this one's totally vegetarian. Um, actually, this one's totally vegan, um, unless you add cheese, which I'm going to later, just because that was one of the things I wanted on the board. Um, but uh, um, yes, so a lot of people are calling them charcuterie. I won't be offended if you don't call it a balabuster board, because no one's going to know what that is. Um, but I think you're all balabusters if you're doing this. So. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end the poll. So if you haven't voted, vote, and we'll see where we stand. Uh, while we're still getting organized, Suzanne, I have an ingredient question on the hummus before we leave it totally. Yes. I'm really excited to try this recipe because any hummus recipe I've ever made has cumin as a predominant ingredient, and this doesn't have any. So maybe... The cumin, the cumin is so dominant. I'm excited to try this without it so that maybe it really highlights the actual taste of chickpea. Yeah, I've got to say, and, and I will say that for my American taste, then I was like, oh, I need to put more. I need more with this one. Um, but at the same time, um, this is very similar to the way my Israeli roommate used to do it and burn those dishes <laughs> at the bottom. I said she was kind of burnt at the bottom of the pan. Um, and this is pretty much what she would do. Um, in this book that is about um, hummus, there's a whole, actually, I was joking about the other, I mean, those are real books too. I've not read the hummus book, but apparently there's a hummus book that's kind of like those Mark Kurlansky books. And it says, if you speak English, you cannot make hummus well. Um, so maybe, maybe English speaking people have really added the cumin. Um, I'm not sure. While we were gone, I have cleaned up my um, food processor. I did not do the world's finest job on it because we're gonna use it again. Amy, is there a question I see? So yeah, no, no, just, um, just to let you all know that this is being recorded. So it'll be on CRC's YouTube page and I'll, I'll let you know how to access that when it's up. Um, we did it, I think we'll get it up this time. Last time we, we had a crash in the middle and it sort of messed up the recording. Um, also, 
Suzanne, just so you know, about half the people here have done this before and half haven't. Just so you know, have made a grazing board or charcuterie oh, before. Oh, great to know. Great to know. So then, um, then we're all just having fun together. And the thing that might be different is they may have never done an Israeli-inspired board before. And I think that's really important for a couple of reasons. First of all, when we're thinking of something that is charcuterie, typically we're thinking of meat, pork. We're thinking of um, things that are meat and milk together, beautiful meats and cheeses. And then we don't maybe necessarily think about extending that to our Jewish holidays. And we don't extend, think about certainly Israeli food as a part of that. And so there are two things I want to talk about. Um, one is this idea that this is the way a lot of Israeli people eat. This is sort of the introduction to a meal is tons of dips and spreads and sauces. And then maybe the meal is just, you know, some falafel or a piece of schnitzel because also, you know, obviously European Jews <laughs> made it to Israel and um, influenced the food culture as well. And the meat and the main dish is kind of secondary to this sort of style of eating. Um, so certainly this adapts very well to this culinary tradition that they already have in Israel of eating these dips and spreads together um, as in, in the way that we use a charcuterie board. It's just putting those two together. And then the other thing is that the possibilities become endless for you to think of these for Jewish holidays. For instance, and at the end I'll show you, um, our family uses this to beautifully display our fruits and nuts for Tu B'Shvat. This is the way we, these methods are what we use even at Hanukkah time, at times when we put a latke board together with smoked salmon and homemade applesauce and sour cream and um, our latkes of different flavors. So you can really adapt it that way. Um, the idea of making these boards can extend to the way you do your challah uh, on a regular Shabbat or the way you put your apples and honey in challah together for Rosh Hashanah or even an ice cream inspired toppings board for Shavuot when we celebrate the receiving of the Torah um, and celebrate those things with milk and honey products because Torah is like the milk and honey to our soul. So there are a lot of ways to really incorporate these boards Jewishly, even if you've made them before and you were like top-notch level charcuterie board maker, I'm inspiring, I'm hoping I'm inspiring you to become a balabusta board maker. Does that make, is that good? Okay, so I'm going to take a moment um, and put the rest of my hummus in the fridge and check on my um, jars because I just wanna see kind of how they're coming with the rest. Oh, good. I'm gonna show you what I'm seeing. What I like a lot is I'm beginning to see the blistering here of the skin. And so I think they're gonna be ready to pull out. But I, what I'm gonna do is one second, I'm gonna put them under a broil just to ensure that that's happening. Um, so if everyone wants to go and check their peppers, we're ready for the next step. Um, so a lot of times recipes recommend that you take the peppers and put them in um, some sort of Tupperware or some sort of container because what happens is this, they are sort of steaming um, off the skins. And I'm hoping that ours might be blistered enough that they just pull off, but we're gonna see. I'm gonna get my colander um, rinse from my chickpeas. Again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm fastidious, of course, and I'm very careful about cross-contamination. But when I'm doing a bunch of vegetarian dishes like this, particularly ones that have common ingredients, I'm not going to like kill myself to make the colander perfectly clean because, you know, lemon, the things are going in the next, the same, the same items are going in the next dish. So I'm going to go pull my peppers from the broiler and you should do the same. They're hot. They're very hot. But they're, they're at a good temperature and a good place for, for me, for what I need, um, for getting off 
the skins. I'm not going to have to do. I'm not going to have to do that Tupperware trick. And just because I said that I'm going to do the same with my eggplant, um, I'm going to throw my eggplant again, which is not a part of the recipe today. This is just one of the vegetables that I was inspired to eat. I'm going to put a Helen, right under the uh, Amarnak sent me this uh, link to a live cooking thing, Jewish cooking thing from her synagogue, I guess. So I'm just shaking my egg. Again, the eggplant is not a part of it. Um, this is just a vegetable I prefer, and I'm throwing them right back in that hot oven because I'm going to put those on my board eventually. Probably not while we're on the phone. I probably should have done that earlier, but. While I was in there, uh, and I'm letting the peppers cool for a second, I happen to, I don't know if you can hear these, my chickpeas, those few for the top are just like roasted and beautiful, and I'm going to put them aside so I can throw them on top of the hummus. Okay, so in normal life, I would recommend that you take these peppers and let them cool, and then the skins will really pull off even more beautifully. But I need like asbestos hands to do this. Um, I'm gonna show you, you should be able to rinse them under water. It always works, hopefully it'll work this time. And you can just peel off the peel. And it should just come off pretty easily. If your peels are not coming off as you wish, then um, you can, while they're still hot, put them in a Tupperware, um, and see if you can kind of steam it off some more. Um, mine's coming off okay. Is everyone's coming off all right? Are we at this point together? Okay. Um, so I'm going to kind of take a few minutes and work on getting those peels off. And if they can't come off, it's not the end of the world. The whole thing can also go right in the food processor for the purpose of today. You know, this is a rough, rustic, style of eating, um, and it, it's fine if there's a little bit of peel. Um, that, now you can also use a jar, an already jarred uh, roasted red pepper. We keep these for making sandwiches at our house. You can see, I mean, it just comes off pretty easily. Um, we keep these for making sandwiches. I'll show you a jar that we use. Now, if you want it, of course, you could skip this step altogether and just use your jar of red pepper, no big deal. Um, so I'm gonna put all of this in the food processor and we'll pretend through the magic of, uh, of not television, of Zoom here, that that's all accomplished and finished. And My pepper skins are not coming off. Okay, if they are not coming off, you might want to throw them back under the broiler for a moment and then Put them in a Tupperware, which will help steam them. Okay. And, it, and it'll help the, it'll help it along. The other thing is you could of course use the skin. It's not gonna, it's not gonna hurt you. We eat red pepper all the time. Um, this is more a consistency and smoothness issue. Okay. So I'm gonna start pulling together the other ingredients for the mohara. Suzanne, when the red peppers are in the jar, are they already peeled? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, I have lost seeing my stuff. Hold on. I just need to run. Okay. Um, so, our oven is hot. Um, you can throw your walnuts in if you like to toast them a little bit further um, to bring out the flavor a little bit more. It pulls out the oils and it creates a toasted flavor. I have some already roasted nuts, so I'm going to use them um, for the sake of the recipe and day. So you're gonna do a cup and a half of walnut, which is actually quite a lot. Um, obviously, if you have an allergy in your home, this is something that you wanna be careful of, but um, it really is delicious. I had never had this until I don't know, within the last year, or if I had had it, I was not aware of it. And it is, I mean, I didn't know what I was eating. It was 
so good. So let me grab a measuring cup. And we're gonna go in with um, one and a half cup of our walnuts. Now in the tradition, this recipe calls for honey. And um, in, I'm gonna get yet another set of measuring spoons because now I'm not sure which one I use to taste with. Um, I'm going to show you a trick that I love about honey. If you ever have an, a recipe that calls for both honey and oil, um, use the oil first because then the honey will slide right off of the measuring spoon or right out of the measuring cup. Um, this one, I'm not adding extra oil because there's a lot of walnuts in there. So I'm just gonna spray and you're gonna be amazed. Okay. So then we're gonna put in our two tablespoons of honey if my container is not stuck together. And I mean, wait for it. You're gonna be so impressed. I'm gonna zoom in so you can see. Okay, watch. Ta-da! Isn't that amazing? O-M-G. Like, I mean, that might be the best thing you've done today. Um, so spray your, spray your measuring cup or your, um, or your measuring spoon, or simply you know, use honey after you've added oil to your list of ingredients. A lot of times when you're putting honey in something, it happens to already have oil. Um, and then I- Can you show us your honey? And like my honey always has like crystals in it and it gets okay. hard. What do you do? So, with that? All right, so honey never goes bad. And this does have some crystals. Um, it never goes bad. You can eat like 3000 year old honey. It's a whole thing. Um, but if your honey crystallizes, I believe you can microwave it um, and re-stir it and it will um, decrystallize. That's not a term of art. Um, but while we're talking about honey, it was a good segue. I, I just, I bought this honey only, I don't even, this also happens to be like an international brand. I only bought it because of the lid. Um, I really, I wanted like a syrup lid honey. So I got that. In a traditional Muhammara recipe, um, you actually use pomegranate glaze. And Molly Gay apparently has taken some online criticism for this recipe using honey, but it's the way I first made it. I'm sticking with it. Um, and, but if you want, we, you can drizzle a little pomegranate molasses over the top, or you can use pomegranate molasses in place of the. Okay, so moving down, I'm sorry, I said lemon because I was moving, I was moving, but um, you can use that in place of the honey. So we're going to do more lemon because I knew that my last lemon from the batch there was the stinker. I'm going to go on and um, roll it out again. Normally, I would be cleaning a little bit more between each step and keeping my workspace a little cleaner, but I am aware of the time. So, um, all right, so the next thing we're going to do is half a lemon. Um, based on my experience with the hummus, I know that this is not like my finest lemon purchase ever. So I'm gonna go in with a whole lemon. Um, I just feel that, I feel it with my heart. And we're gonna do the two cloves of garlic. And again, I'm gonna go and use a teaspoon for each clove of the minced for the magic of Zoom. And I'm gonna put a little extra for the love of garlic. Um, I mentioned cumin earlier. This recipe does call for cumin. So we're gonna do, oh no, a new container of cumin. I'm gonna have to open it. Um, so we're gonna do a teaspoon of cumin. This is one of those things that, you know, cilantro and cumin derived from and coriander, all the same thing. If you're one of those people who has the soap gene, do you know about the DNA that makes you not like the cumin? So it apparently tastes like soap to some people and it's actually a genetic thing. Um, so I had a friend once who would tell me that she hated it and I was like, things like a baby, it's in everything delicious. And then she was vindicated years later when there was an actual artic, uh, you know, article, like an academic article published that said, it's like a, some sort of recessive gene if you like human or not. So um, if you don't like it, just skip it. 
<clears throat> All right, red chili flakes are going in. And, you know, you consider the, the flavor and the profile of your family. We like spice, so I'm going to go on and do the half a teaspoon that was called for. Um, that feels right to me. And, oh, I said there was no, um, I said there was no oil in this when I showed you my cool trick, but there actually is, um, there are two tablespoons of olive oil. And again, we're gonna do salt and pepper paste. I find that this recipe does not need additional black pepper because it has the, um, because it has so many other kinds of pepper in it. But I'm gonna do about a half a teaspoon to start of uh, kosher salt. Again, you can always add more, you can't add less. So um, start with a smaller amount than you think you need of salt. And then you can always add in later. I'm gonna begin the pulsing and it's gonna be loud for a moment because they're nuts this time. It's gonna, it's gonna be loud for sure. Once I get it pulsed enough, I will make it smooth. I mean, and then I'll just put it on. So forgive me, Amy, do we have one more poll? Well, we don't have another poll, but if anybody wants to ask a question of Suzanne. Um, Barbara, I see you have some questions on here about grazing boards. I think she's going to get to that. Barbara's questions were, you know, can you make grazing boards out of desserts or cheese, nuts, and fruits? Oh, yes. And those things are all going to go on my grazing board um, in just a moment, actually. So let me, let me um, blend for just a minute. And I'm just, while she's pulsing that, I just want to throw out, please, please, if you have something that you really um, enjoy and you'd like to share it with us, we're going to be doing this monthly, hopefully for years to come <laughs> and at least many months to come. We have to start planning out till May 2022 uh, with the CRC calendar. So um, if you would, uh, you can put it in the, you can send a little note to me or to everybody or the something that you love to make and we'll take note of it and Pam and I will get in touch with you. You don't have to be um, a balabusta. You don't have to be a, you know, a really super experienced chef. Just something that you love to make that you've made uh, and enjoy making and would love to share. So just throwing that out. Okay, unlike the other recipe, I'm not touching this. I don't have to do a thing. This is straight fire. It is amazing. I hope that you have tasted it and found the same thing of yours. Has anyone tasted theirs yet? No, okay. It's really good. And I'm gonna go through that same procedure one more time. The beets are still cooking and they're gonna need just a second. So I'm gonna put this in my bowl. And to get to the question that we had just a moment ago, um, we're gonna start assembling our bowl soon. And I have, or board soup. I have pulled dried nuts. Um, sorry, dried fruits. Um, I love fresh fruit on them as well. I'm going to use pistachios. So as we go to assemble the board, we're going to have a chance to do that. But I'm going to take just a moment and get this in a bowl. And that will be the last time we use the food processor. So this time you can really, you know, put it away for a real cleaning. Do I have it zoomed in? I, I cannot see myself at all. Do I have it zoomed in appropriately? Yeah, the camera's perfect. Okay. Um, so we're going to obviously top this bowl as well. To me, the obvious topper for this is a walnut because you do need to tell people that it has um, nuts in it. That's always important. Today we have so many allergies. Um, you know, if you're serving a communal board like this, I mean, I know at this moment we're all at home and these boards are probably a little smaller and for our immediate relatives who, of course, you know, if they have, can have nuts or not. But, um, if you're, if we ever get to the point where we're having these beautiful gatherings again with multiple people, you know, it's going to be important to show that um, an item has nuts in it. So I'm gonna put a little bit of walnut on top there um, in a few minutes when we get to that point. 
And I'm going to set this aside for cleaning later. Um, and um, now my chickpeas have um, have cooled enough that I can comfortably touch them. And you can see just as they're going down on the on the bowl there. So now it's getting very chaotic over here um, on my cooking side. However, the good news is we are not going to need the colander. Well, we will need the colander. We're not going to need the food processor again. You can just put it away for washing later. Again, in my real life, normally I would begin washing this right away because I like a very clean book surface. Um, but, you know, that's not the reality of today. So we're going to come over here and uh, while the beets continue to cook a little bit, we're going to begin working with these vegetables that we've cleaned. Um, so um, obviously we have peppers on our board to begin with. Um, taking one of my clean bar mops that doesn't have schmitz on it already. Okay. And I'm going to show you just how I like to slice my peppers for, for dipping. Um, I like very thin. I feel like people, and a refined cut, even though we're doing something rustic with the board, I like um, long, thin, pretty cuts. Um, they're still sturdy enough for dipping, but it's going to allow, and then if I have something here like this that's like a little uglier, I will just put that aside for cooking for the week. Um, a, little, a little tidbit, literally about bits that I like to do, is throughout the week if I'm making like um, a, for instance, like a zucchini pasta, you know, you get the nub at the end, you, you can't get it all the way through the spiralizer. You have a little um, piece like this that's just not pretty for a board. Um, or pretty, you know, for a presentation on part of your dinner, then I always save the bits and those will make a great little soup or stir fry or even in addition to eggs or something like that later in the week. Um, so, you know, I never try to waste food, um, but I, for this, we're really going to want something, you know, prettier. So um, I kind of make two piles, my pretty and my not so pretty. Um, similarly, we've got coming out of the wash, um, we have our celery. Um, I'm using celery. You certainly do not have to use celery, although it seems like on the pole. Oh, shoot. Celery down. You can see that wash really pulls out the dirt. I'm still cutting off the end, but you know, a lot of times there's a lot of dirt stuck in there, and it's just not there in this case. So um, I'm gonna show you on the celery, I think a really, again, a long, thin piece is, is really lovely. Um, I like cutting things on, on a diagonal, maybe sometimes first so that you get a pretty point. Um, but people tend to talk about, you know, like, oh, the vegetables are so much better when someone else cuts them. And I completely agree. Um, but especially when someone has taken the care to like, really cut them artfully um, on an angle or thin enough to really enjoy, or if you do have hearty dips, maybe thick enough to enjoy. Um, save this because it's pretty. Um, you might be able to use that on your board later. It's not necessarily something that's going on ours today, but you know, when you're making a vegetable board, vegetable board, a board with vegetables, it's always good to have um, a piece of parsley or um, lettuce or just something beautiful underneath. Again, I use the organic, sometimes you get an ugly bit that just needs to be thrown away. Oh, I didn't mean to put that with my, my bits of pepper for later. Um, and you know, you're, you're gonna wanna cut for the size of your group. Uh, right now our groups are, tend to be pretty small. Um, and so, you know, maybe you're not gonna be cutting that much right now. Um, Cucumber, I like to use these English cucumbers. I've got a couple today. I wanna to show you different things. You can take a, um, a zester and go all the way down and make stripes in it if you like. Um, you can always use a food peeler, you know, to make those stripes every other place. Um, of course, cucumber rounds are the way people often cut them. I like the idea of, oops, hold on, I've gotta move the, I've gotta move my beets for a minute. 
Um, if you do a round, I like the idea of going on the diagonal just to be a little bit more interesting. Then you're getting, you can see a bit of that pretty, um, a bit of that pretty part of the, um, of the, excuse me, I kind of lost my train of thought, of the skin, which has been peeled off. Um, you can also do these in a long, thin stick, but I would, I, I recommend this over just going straight in a row. And then if you're really, really, um, you know, in the mood for, for patch king a lot, you can make deep grooves in your, um, in your cucumber and then you kind of get like a beautiful scalloped effect, but, um, it's just sort of a, a more interesting way to cut. Now, this is um, an English cucumber. It's almost all I use anymore. Um, I know it's not the cucumber that I grew up with, but I like these English or curvy cucumbers. They're just, the seeds are not as bitter to me. Um, you know, they're, it's just um, a little better for, for something like this. I'm also a believer in using what you like. So we're gonna do tomatoes and we're gonna do cucumbers but um, I'm a fan of, you know, using what you know you're gonna eat. And my children are gonna want this with these sugar snap peas, which are, are not at all traditional um, to go with this, of course, but they're something that our family enjoys. And so that's gonna be on our, um, similarly, honestly, I don't know that my family really eats radishes, but they're so pretty. Um, on a board. And so I'm going to do a few, almost more as a garnish. They're clean here because they were apart. And I'm going to leave them just like that. To me, we're not really going to eat them. Um, so, or we're, we're probably not going to eat them. But if you are going to be eating them, I mean, how lovely is that? Just to pull aside, get, you know, it's so much more appetizing to eat something that someone has touched. Um, and you can tell that it's been cleaned and and cared for with love. So I, but I personally like the tail on. Um, I just think it's pretty. Um, and that does not bother me at all. If you don't dig that, cut your tail, you know, off and slice it up. But I just, I think it's really pretty on the board. Um, okay. Similarly, carrot, I like to do a long, thin um, presentation on my carrots. I don't mind. Um, having the peel on at all. Some people don't care for that. And so you might want to start peeling your carrots at this point if you're doing carrots on your board, um, just to clean it up. I have a lot of, um, you know, my, I do have kids. So um, I kind of probably will peel, although I don't mind it. Um, and then I'm just gonna cut them long, um, long ways as opposed to chunks. I feel like the chunks, um, are lovely and if, if that's the way you prefer to get a big piece, go for it. Um, the other thing that I have that's gonna go in my board are at this point, I'm, I have all these little tomatoes. Um, it's hard to think of doing an Israeli board without tons of tomatoes and tons of um, cucumber. So that's something that's gonna make it on my board. Um, something that's not edible that's gonna make it on my board. Let me get my knife, my paring knife back and I'll show you. Is lemon. We have lemon prominently featured throughout our board. Um, so, you know, this is not edible, but it's something we're gonna, we're gonna use to decorate and show that we have, um, that, that, that there's lemon in everything. So if you've never done this, I encourage you to do this. Um, just take a knife, paring knife, and kind of make a Charlie Brown shirt zigzag uh, chevron through your lemon, rotating your lemon as you go. Um, Suzanne, we can't see your hand, your hand or arm is kind of in the way. Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Let me see if, I'm, if this will be better. Hopefully I will not cut myself well. Let's see, are you seeing that now? I'm just kind of going up and down. And now I've come back together. And that's gonna be a beautiful lemon for display um, as a part of my board. I'm sorry, I didn't realize. Um, so, and of course I have my eggplant 
my eggplants cooking. Um, so I wanna check on the beets really quickly to see if they're starting to get kind of fork tender. Ooh, they're very tender. So I'm gonna get those into my calendar. Um, and I would recommend you do the same if you've got your beets going. Suzanne, is your daughter Annabelle doing the filming or is it just on a tripod? Is it on a tripod? I think people would be interested to know so that you're not intimidated. We will help if you decide you want to lead, we want you to know that we can help you with the tech. And Suzanne has been experimenting with this and she's teaching us some things. Um, so just so you know that, don't let that be a um, intimidating factor. We can help figure this out for you so that you don't have to worry about it. And so easily supply you with a tripod for the yeah, day. We try to get one for our programming, so. So I saw someone was holding um, gloves earlier, had gloves on earlier. Um, I'm not too concerned because I have not had a, well, I might have even over them a little bit. I have not had a manager um, in since last um, March. Uh, but you should just be able to pretty much scrub off of the paper towel or your gloved hands, your beet um, skin at this point. It should just come off. Now, unlike the peppers, this should just be rolling right off without any additional um, trouble at all. And so we're going to, I'm not going to do all my beet. I purposely reached in and got this big, big mama beet here. Um, so that I could um, peel it quickly and show you. Um, and, then, and then I'll use this one as my example beat. And then we'll put our boards together. So, um, you know, I don't want anyone to burn themselves or stain their counters or stain themselves up. But um, if anybody's doing it, do they have beats out at this point? Okay, your beets are out. Um, again, I am I am not afraid of my manicure at this point in my life because I have no manicure. So I'm gonna just put a little cold water and I'm looking for my vegetable brush. Oh, here it is. And my vegetable brush is really gonna assist me in getting that a little bit more. And you can see it's not really dying my hand anymore now that it now that it's been um, boiled. And again, I prefer roasting, but we would be here all day if we were you know, using a traditional roast only. If you need to, you can at this point certainly bring out your peeler. I mean, and you can see if you do that, it's just like butter. I mean, it comes right off. Um, but I wanna be able to finish in time. So I'm gonna just cut off this end here, this ugly end. And I'm going to move back to the clean cutting board. Again, this is probably not the method I would prefer normally, or if you were in my home drinking a glass of wine, it would be a little tidier looking. But I'm just going to show you. The beets should be tender enough to cut, but still have a little bit of give to them. Um, because, you know, you don't want to be serving anybody mushy beets. Um, so I'm going to cut kind of in quarters. Um, this is a big beet, so it might, you know, they're not going to be like on my little golden, it's going to definitely be quarters when that, when it's time to cut that. But, um, this one is, is huge. So, um, it's going to, there's going to be a little bit more here and I'm going to get this in a, in one of my serving bowls. There's no sense in dirtying up two bowls on this. So I'm going to get this straight in one of my serving bowls. And then we'll use the um, we'll we'll use one of the other bowls that I plan to use for something on the board. Um, oops, that won't hurt a bit. It'll be delicious later. Um, so we're going to take just another one of these little bowls that I'm going to use. And again, you, these can be mixing bowls. This can go on a cookie sheet. This does not have to be anything too perfect or precious. Um, like I said, I just wanted to do this because we were doing this sort of Israeli and I thought the blue and white was nice and I had it. And so it's easy to do that. But 
throughout the year, I use different boards for different things. Sometimes I use the cutting board itself. I have been known to put butcher paper on my table and it goes right down the table. Um, I've used, you know, a big serving tray. It, all sorts of things, depending on the level of formality of an event. Maybe I want it on my silver platter. Um, maybe I want it on, you know, my cute uh, cutting board that looks like Missouri that I got on Etsy. You know, you can just try different things. But we're going to work on making the um, sesame seeds. So if you refer to the Facebook page, Um, if you refer to the recipe, um, it's the sesame beets. I'm looking in my board. Okay, so once again, lemon juice. Figuring it, coming in strong on this. So we're going to take in yet another lemon, and we're going to roll this out and um, get our lemon juice going in our bowl. Amy, I don't have my glasses on and I got kind of far away from my recipe. Can you tell me what's the next thing? Um, is there somebody who has the recipe open that can help? Uh, oh, no big deal. I'll just, I'll, I'll take a step over. Sorry, that's my bad. So we're gonna do two tablespoons of lemon juice followed by two tablespoons of cider vinegar. And I'm gonna show you something that I like to do. I use a lot of vinegar in my house. Um, and I said that and I pulled out my rice wine vinegar, but I keep them all in these restaurant containers and I've labeled them so that, um, I can just easily squeeze in the correct vinegar. Let me go get the correct one. Um, oh my goodness. My little budding chef has used some of my cider vinegar. Hopefully this is enough. It is not. I need to replenish. So we're going to go in with the two tablespoons. I'll just make it equal parts um, of the cider vinegar after I showed you how I have my cute little thing. I had to use the, the big jar anyway. Um, but anyway, it just helps me when I'm cooking at night because sometimes I will have my cider vinegar, my red wine vinegar, my balsamic vinegar, lots of things going at once. And so that's a helpful little tip, even though I did as I said and not as I did. Um, we're going to use a tablespoon of sesame seeds. Are you kidding? This is also a fresh container of sesame seeds. I'm going to inept try to pop it off here. And obviously, since this is a sesame beet, you want to, you know, not put that. Yeah. Um, a teaspoon of sugar. If you don't want to use sugar, that's fine. You can get more honey. In fact, I think um, I think I will just use regular white sugar because that's what's called for. But um, certainly, you could use, you know, a stevia or monk fruit, or skip it if you, you know, didn't want to put added sugar for whatever reason. Beets happen to be sweet. Um, naturally. So um, that's something that you can, you know, skip if you want. But this is sort of making like a sweet and spicy, you know, sweet and sour sort of situation for your beets. Not quite an old fashioned pickle beet, but just a little bit of that sort of, you know, something reminiscent of that. And then green onions. If you don't know this trick, I want to show you what my favorite we cut our, I leave my green onions in the bundle and I just cut like this with my, if you don't have cut code kitchen shears, I keep saying like, you don't need anything fancy. You don't need anything fancy. You don't need anything fancy, but this is something I totally recommend. They're amazing. Um, and so just put those right in your mix. And we're going to turn back around. I'm going to just put this over our beef. That's obviously going to get better with time. That's something that is just going to get better and better throughout the day. And I want to 
keep everything on schedule appropriately. So now we're gonna begin the process that you've all been waiting for, the creation of the board itself. Um, three wonderful recipes here. Um, Jewish, and they truly are Jewish because they're inspired by the places that Jews lived as they moved throughout the world. And, um, and also truly Jewish mentioned in the Torah in the case of the hummus. Um, and, and all of these beautiful vegetables, what's more Jewish than what comes from the earth. Um, so let me get those over here and we'll get everything pulled together. So again, this could be to scale um, of any size that okay. you're um, I happen to be using a very, go. a very large board. Um, and that's why I have these full-size bowls. But, you know, imagine that you could be on a smaller board just for your family of one even. Um, if you're making this for yourself and you want it to be beautiful. Um, and it doesn't have to have this much with it. But I've pulled together a bunch of things that I like and that I think go well with this. Um, you know, obviously each board is different. There are times when I do cheese and honey and crackers and nuts and berries um, on a board because I think those go well together. But in this case, you know, we're doing this sort of Israeli Middle Eastern. I love these little hot um, hot pickles. Um, you can get them at Collins. You can get them in an international aisle. They are marked kosher. Um, you know, these are these little Israeli style. Uh, and, and Arab style spicy pickles. So I wanna do um, some of these in one of my bowls. And so, you know, you could get your colander back out if you wish, um, but I'm just gonna, I have clean hands, obviously. Um, I'm going to make a little bowl of these pickles. They can go straight on the board, of course, and nothing has to be in bowls. Um, and nothing has to be on a board, as I said. It can be straight on your kitchen table. But um, since I knew that I wanted to use a few things in bowls today, just because I liked the look of it, um, I am I'm, I'm you know putting some of my kind of wet ingredients in the bowls. Um, and even if I were putting it straight on the board, any um, which would be fine. Um, I would still kind of kind of be putting in what I know is going down first, sort of randomly like this. Anytime that you're putting olives or pistachios or dates that aren't pitted, anything like that that happens to be going on your board, go on and do your guest a favor and put a pit bowl. Um, so you can see I'm kind of building out with my, my hard factors that I know are going in first. So, you know, these were the three recipes we made. I was never going to sacrifice any of them. The rest of it is just the stuff to dip inside. So um, then you want to start kind of filling in and it can be, it can be messy. It can be jumbled. It can be, you know, wherever you think, if you see a little negative space someplace, you can, and I'm actually going to cut a little, by the way, I'm going to be cutting a little more vegetables um, because we are actually, because the weather was so nice and because we have a heater, um, we're going to have our family over for an outside dinner, masked and distant, of course, but we're going to be doing that this evening. And so I'll be cutting more vegetables. I just didn't want to waste your time. Whoa, waste your time with that. Um, but you're going to fill in every available spot. Um, and if you see like a negative space and you have something pretty, throw in that top of the celery that we had. Um, this is a good place to artfully place one of your lemons um, to start building out. Um, and and there's, no, there's no magic. Um, you do want it for soft things. You want to be able to throw a spreader or a little... Um, fork in for things that are going to need that. Of course, you're going to want to have spoons for each item if there's a, a need for a spoon. Um, and so as you go, you want to think, gosh, I'm getting kind of green and I'm getting yellow and orange here. So maybe this is a good time to start going in with some tomatoes, a pop of color. 
um, maybe this is a good time to um, introduce something totally different on the board. Um, so does anyone have any questions as I work just on the actual composition and what I'm doing? Okay. And I have a question about how would a fam how does a family enjoy this? Like, do you, does everybody have their own plate and like put the dip on their plate and like, pull, I mean, how sort of what's the eating process? Okay. So what I would do and what I will do this evening, um, and again, we do this on a very small scale and a large scale. So it's not, um, you know, this is something we do just for the four of us. And if it's for the four of us, obviously our kind of safety precautions are different. And, um, and we just literally sit around and dig in. I'll show you in my cupboard here that's above. You can see I'm just a believer in all white stacks of plates. And I would just grab those upper um, appetizer plates and I would maybe fill a rustic jar with all of our forks and I would just put it out with napkins and that would be it. Now we're in times of COVID. Um, so things are gonna be a little bit different um, with these relatives coming over and we're gonna be outside this evening. Um, so, <laughs> and in masked and I'm gonna be much more careful. I might actually help serve them um, so that we're not having any, you know, ooh, COVID moments on our, um, you know, with the communal food. Um, and so I think that all of this for tonight is going to be served with, I'm just going to make falafel. That's it. And um, so they're going to be able to kind of make it once and not like stand over. We don't want any double dippers at this point in our world. So, um, but that's, that's how I would do it. Just a big, beautiful stack of plates next to it normally. Um, also, the, all of this, I wanted to say, could go very well um, in a box to go. You could easily use a remnant of even an Amazon box, and you could cover it in foil if you're, you know, nervous about, um, if you're nervous about germs or dirt. Um, but even wrapping paper or butcher paper down on the end. And then you can close that box and it's perfect to go to a picnic. If we ever get to go to opera theater or concerts in the park again, you know, you're ready to go for that. So, um, and then of course it's, it's all finger food at that point. Um, okay, I'm gonna show you how I use nuts. We got a specific question. And I do tend to sort of do a fruit and vegetable side. I don't know why. There's no reason your fruits and your vegetables can't touch, but. I like to sort of do a, um, a sweet side and a savory side. That's just something I end up sort of doing. Um, so I'm gonna go in with my, um, my dried fruits and nuts over here. You wanna think about all sides as you're making a composition because every single side is gonna be visible to someone if you have this down the middle of a buffet or a communal table and you want there to be like just something for them to discover and enjoy at each spot. Um, and so um, again, don't be afraid to put stuff directly into crevices. Um, you know, it can touch each other. Um, can you see what I'm doing back here? I'm kind of building out a pretty side over here with some dried fruits and nuts. Um, we want to Oh, that reminds me, let me get some walnuts to throw on top of that muhammara so that we are um, identifying that it is made of nuts for, for those you know, who need it um, to, be, to know that they're, if they're eating a nut or not. Um, a great thing to infill with would be crackers. Um, and crackers, you could just layer right in the crevices, of course. But I'm going, I want to introduce you to this pita, if you're not familiar with it. Um, if you do keep kosher, I am not sure if it's hectured. It is marked vegan. Um, it is from a local company. It's a, a family of, I think, Syrian refugees, certainly a Syrian family um, who makes just the best pita that I know of in St. Louis. It's made fresh here. And it's available in a couple of the stores. Um, I know we have you know, congregants who have affiliations at different stores, so I don't want to put one over the other, but 
it's the one that rhymes with Schmierberg's has it. Um, and so um, what I, I love the idea of these beautiful whole ones. Um, and <laughs> what time should you all be at my home? Thank you for saying that. So I, um, I was just the name of the bag again. Yes, it's called Sham. And it's so good, you guys. It's, it's just, they're just above and beyond. They're like the big flat kind. And look even how pretty it like, you know, it takes up a great amount of space on the board. It, it's just really, really lovely. Mm -hmm. I'm on the board. Okay, so of course there are gonna be a few more vegetables throughout the evening. Um, oh, and I wanna get out this good feta cheese also. I just got these at K Hall. I'm super excited about them. I don't know why you don't need anything fancy. I kept saying that, but then I did buy those at K Hall because I thought they were so cool. Um, and let's what, see. What is K Hall? Oh, it's a gift store here in town. Um, and the woman just happens to find like the best candles and the best little spreaders and things. At our home, we are big into the gift closet. Um, you know, I'm from the South and I always want to walk away when I go to someone's house with a little hostess gift. And to me, little spreaders and forks and things like that are just the best things to take. Um, so I kind of bought it originally thinking maybe I was going to, um, I see a hole over here. I'm going to fill that in with something. Oh, my cheese. Um, but I, I happen to love it so much that I was like, I'm going to take that from the gift closet and put it on my own board today. Obviously, I'm going to take the tag off and um, wash it. <laughs> um, but, but I just, um, I, so we're making a composition here. I want to show you this feta cheese. So at this point, our board is completely vegan. Um, however, I love the muhammara with feta um and i i've been looking for a long time if anyone knows where to get it the there was this pastor of eden israeli feta that was like life changingly good um and i can't find it anywhere anymore um however i, I know you can order it online i haven't quite gotten to that yet i feel like this might be close. Um, this is a product of Greece, um, but it's in brine and it sort of seemed like it might be um, close enough for me. For those of you who, who keep kosher, there is a hexer. I am not familiar with what this hexer is, like what union or who does that. So obviously you would want to leave that off your board altogether if you're vegan or if you strictly keep kosher. However, if you'll indulge me, we can check and I will tell you if it tastes like that amazing Pastors of Eden Israeli that I've been dreaming of, Israeli feta that I've been dreaming of, um, finding a replacement for. I mean, it's in the brine. It kind of looks the same. Let's see. Now, I often do cheese right on the board, but my one of my daughters is extremely lactose intolerant. So this one I am going to do um, in, a, in a container just because I don't want it getting on anything for her. Um, we have discovered this one brand called, I think it's Veal Life or Vial Life, um, which is um, a great vegan cheese. Um, but let's see. Hmm. I'm gonna just put some cubes of this. You can always dress this with olive oil or honey. Um, I don't wanna put anything on it just yet because we are going to not be eating for a while. Um, oh, it's good, but it's not the Pastors of Eden, you guys. I'm really sad to say it is not, it's not as good as what I was hoping, but it's pretty yummy. And combined, it's gonna be really lovely um, on the board. And then this leaves us a little bit more room. I'm still going to have my pit bowl nearby, but that leaves me a room to go in with some crackers. Which I so I just have some water crackers here. These are like, you know, a family favorite. There's no one that doesn't love a water cracker. 
and they fan out so beautifully when you're making a board. I mean, it just like, look for the holes, look for the color composition. Um, you know what, I might put like one strawberry over here to um, correct my color. And of course, I'm actually gonna put lots more of these vegetables uh, by tonight. But this is our Bala Busta board, celebrating Israeli Saladim. Zan, quick question from uh, uh, Judy: um, Is the sh is the cheese sheep's milk? Um, authentic feta is not cow's milk. Right, of course. Um, this particular one, uh, because I was is actually, and it will say this one is a cow's milk. The Pastors of Eden one that I'm always looking for is actually a sheep's milk. It's it's made in Israel. Um, it's it's but of course, traditional feta is usually from Greece and is um, is goat or or sheep. So, got it. But I'm just trying. I'm I'm trying to find something to match something in my, you know, memory here. And I thought this was going to be the one, and it's not. It's still good. It's like I mean, who's going to turn down a piece of feta cheese, with, especially with one of these olives? Oh, and I didn't mention, of course. Usually I use like a briny Greek Kalamata olive, but in this case, you know, this is, you know, this is like this sort of Israeli situation. You know, you get this, it's delicious. So um, also for this particular dish. Thank you. Does anyone have anything else? I feel like, did I do it on time? I don't know what time it is. Yeah, that was fantastic. And will you, can you show us a few photos? Do you have those handy? I do. Boards? Okay, let's see if this is going to work. I'm trying. Can you hear me? Is it, I hope it's not like sharing my screen and at this moment. Um, Give us a little tour of a few of the boards that you've made. I'm, I'm trying. I'm sorry. I don't know why it is. Well, I'm first gonna pull up a photo grid of some of them rather than doing them each individually because it's taking me a minute here. So I'm gonna do a grid of all of them. Okay. So if you look in the upper left-hand corner, um, this is a basket with flowers, honey, apple, hala, um, Erev Rosh Hashanah. It was Erev Rosh Hashanah. Um, and uh, our, it was both Shabbat and Arab Rosh Hashanah and our candles. So you can see the board doesn't necessarily have to be this involved thing, just something that you can go and grab um, something for the holiday. Kind of moving along in the upper right, we have a Tu B'Shvat board. Tu B'Shvat is the Jewish um, holiday that celebrates the time that the trees awaken from their winter slumber, and it's about renewal. Um, it, there are different elements of, um, in a traditional Kabbalistic um, Tu B'Shvat Seder, there are foods that represent different elements of nature and people's personalities. Um, and so there are things that are soft on the outside, but surprisingly hard on the inside or hard on the outside and surprisingly delicious on the inside when you get to know them better. And all those foods are represented there along with the changing seasons. You can see there are glasses of wine and juice, which go throughout. In the center of the board, we have a barbecue Shabbat board that had some traditional Israeli dishes, sort of like what we're having tonight. Um, in case you're wondering if I put some sort of, that was a vegan dip in the middle. I don't want anyone to think on Shabbat we're having like a meat and dairy meal. Um, <laughs> moving around, we have a board for Hanukkah that featured jams and cheeses and olives, but also latkes and um, sour cream and smoked salmon, which isn't showing up particularly well in that picture. And then what's more Jewish than a Sunday morning bagel board. So we have some, a board here that represents, and this was for our small family. You can see there are only um, four little pieces of bagel there. I'm also trying to cut down on carbs like everyone else, it's the new year. So, um, but here's a Sunday morning bagel board that we had recently. And in each of these, I hope you can see that things are stacked and shoved and placed differently on each board. There are flowers that are around the boards. Um, you know, it, 
it, it all matters. To me, it matters what you put the board down on. So I hope this is going to go down on a beautifully set table for everyone tonight. And um, bring in your elements of the holiday. You can see we have our tubish fat leaves. We have our Hanukkah uh, dish towel just even placed beneath to kind of um, help from, you know, if anybody was getting sour cream off to the side. So those are sort of how we do the boards throughout the year. Um, I have one that I'm not feet showing right now, but that is a um, secular Valentine's Day board that was just all um, goodies and treats and chocolates. Um, you know, obviously that's not a Jewish board. That's just a board board. But um, this is kind of how I incorporate these through holidays throughout the year. Thanks. So that's it. Well, Suzanne, we learned so much and it is exactly noon. You're incredible. Your timing is amazing. <laughs> and um, I want to encourage everybody to, if you do put one of these together tonight or any time, send an email to a photo to me. I'll share it with the group. We'll put it up on CRC's Facebook page. Um, we'll, as soon as this is up on YouTube, we'll let you know in an email so that you can access that or share it with friends. And um, as you remember next month, March 21st, we're going to be making popovers and matzo brai. And just a reminder again, to just be in touch. And if, we, um, if you have something you'd like to share, let us know and we'll help you with the tech. <laughs> So, Suzanne, thank you so much. Thank you, Suzanne, for all You're of welcome. Thank you. I'm going to just stay on. I'm the host. So if you want to stay on and schmooze for a few minutes or ask, um, you know, just talk to other CRC members, feel free. Otherwise, um, we'll hope to see you all soon.